I'm going to tell you a story now, a true story, and it involves a musician. Igor Stravinsky, who is now considered to be one of the great composers of the 20th century, if not the most important composer of the 20th century. That's Jonah Lehrer again. And Jonah tells the story of two concerts, one year apart, in the same city, the exact same piece of music. The audience that heard it first and the audience that heard it second heard totally different things. So let's begin. First, uh, Jonah, how does this um, just set the scene? This is May 1913. It's a spring night? It's a, it's a balmy summer night. Black tie costumes, the women have their fedoras. This was evening clothes. Yeah, well, this was the Russian ballet. This was high art. Mm. And the program said this is a concert about springtime. But as they settled into their seats, it turns out that what Stravinsky had in mind was not spring like honeybees. No, the spring Stravinsky had in mind was about change, about radical change, ritual murder. Literally, that's what the story of the play is. It's, it's a pagan ritual where at the end the virgin gets massacred. Oh, dear. But the music itself is fascinating. The beginning is this very charming bassoon. It's, it's a classic Lithuanian folk tune. And it does sound like the earth is warming. And that lasts for about a minute. And then we get some tutti of flutes, and it's it's lovely. It's getting a little more disturbing. And then about three minutes into it, everything changes. There's, there's, there's just an earthquake. Stravinsky plays this chord. There's a great story that when Diaghilev, who was the head of the Ballet Russe, first heard this chord, and Stravinsky was playing it on the piano for him, he asked Stravinsky, how long will it go on like that? And Stravinsky looked at him and said, to the end, my dear. <laughs> and, and it literally does. That chord structures the music. It's one of the most difficult sounds you've ever heard. It is, it is just the stereotype of dissonance. It is, it hurts you. Huh. Well, what happened? Well, after about three minutes, they rioted. They what? They rioted. <laughs> Meaning what, like they screamed or threw? They screamed, there was blood. <laughs> old ladies were hitting each other with canes. <laughs> Why were old ladies? Old ladies should have gone and hit. Stravinsky with a cane. Well, once they started screaming, Stravinsky ran backstage and by some accounts was crying. Nijinsky was off on the side of the stage screaming to his dancers to keep the beat. Wow. Quite the fiasco. And the question is why? This is the feeling question. Mm -hmm. Why so much feeling about a piece of music? Why did they riot? You would think that they rioted because they were hot, because they didn't like those sounds, because they they thought those dancers were making strange and odd gestures. Well, Jonah offers a different theory. Well, let me put it this way. This riot has been talked about and written about for forever. But to the best of our knowledge, no one has ever tried to explain what happened that night through the lens of um, brain chemistry. Brain chemistry? Yeah, what music can do to a brain you know if, if you try to imagine yourself where all you've heard is wagner and and the great romanticism of 19th century music um, and then all of a sudden you get this i mean these these are noises you've never heard before no, it's all very new, but scientists are beginning to figure out what happens in our brain when we hear noises we've never heard before, especially dissonant noises. We find that chords, musical chords that are typically judged to be dissonant, elicit these wild fluctuations in brain activity. This is Jan Fishman. He is a neuroscientist, and he studies those wild fluctuations in the brain. On an area of the brain called the auditory cortex. Let's zoom into the auditory cortex for a moment, because this is basically hearing central. And when you're listening to music, 
There are all kinds of neurons doing all kinds of things. One gang in particular that Jan is interested in. That's right. A gang that he suspects gets very agitated when it hears sounds like these. These neurons might be the new noise department because he thinks their job is to take every new, strange, unordered, unpredictable noise that comes into the brain and figure it out. Find the pattern. There are groups of neurons whose sole job it is... This is how Jonah puts it. ...to turn that dissonant note, dissect it, take it apart, and try to understand it. We are pattern-searching animals. And this is how Jan Fishman puts it. And so at the level of the auditory cortex, the brain has this daunting task of having to be able to disentangle this complex mixture of sounds. Most of the time, those neurons in the auditory cortex succeed in finding the pattern. But every so often, no. Wait, the maybe this was the case that night, they fail. Okay, so Robert, imagine inside the brains, inside the heads of the people in the audience listening to the Rite of Spring that night were all of these neurons... Yeah, I can hear them. ...trying to make sense of the new sounds and failing. This is unlike anything I was ever prepared for, ever. Not just failing once or twice, but over and over and I, over Yeah, because the over. Rite of Spring keeps being dissonant all the way through, so they can never get any rest. And when those neurons fail, repeatedly... There are consequences. Chemical consequences. What happens is our neurons squirt out a bit of dopamine. And what does the dopamine do? Well, dopamine makes us feel. A little dopamine makes you feel happy. That's why sex and drugs make you feel euphoric. But a little too much. And that euphoria turns into literally schizophrenia. Really? Yes. I don't want to oversimplify schizophrenia in any way, shape, or form. But some of our most effective treatments for schizophrenia work by suppressing dopamine release in the brain. So there's some kind of relationship. Too much dopamine has been shown clinically to make people feel crazy. Yes. Maybe that's what happened that night on May 19th, 1913. Music erupted. Neurons, neurons revolted. Right. Dopamine flooded through the cyst to their brains. And people went mad. Literally mad. Let's go to the second night. This, this, this piece comes back to Paris, does it not? Yes. How it, much it's... later after the riot? Uh, it's from May to March. Oh. So it's almost a year later. Yes. And this time it doesn't come with the ballet. This time it's just being performed as a work of music. So do, does anyone buy tickets? Oh, yeah. It's, 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 it's going to sell out. It did cause a few nights of violent riots. Can you set up the situation now, the audience? Is it a different audience? Uh, I, I actually don't know if the audience is different. But we can at least say that the audience is coming to it with a different set of information. Exactly. They, they've been warned. So for the first time, they can actually sit back and really try to pay attention to the notes. By being willing to listen, they could hear the orders and patterns that Stravinsky had hidden in this work. They were able to hear the music and find the orders hidden underneath this noise. Was there a riot this time, the second round? Oh no, quite the opposite. Stravinsky was a hero. They carried him out on their shoulders. Really? He, literally? He was, he was... Literally, he was carried on their shoulders, and, and, and the press was glowing. In one year? In one year. In just one year, Stravinsky had gone from villainous monster to hipster icon. To the extent that police had to escort him from the concert hall to keep him safe from adoring fans. And that was just the beginning. The, the third story, if you wanted to tell a third story, would be it became children's music. It became Disney music in 1940. 27 years after Stravinsky had caused a violent, bloody riot, he was negotiating with Mickey Mouse <laughs> over the rights to use his music in Fantasia. Which Fantasia? Is it starring a hippopotamus in a little tutu? No, it's Is that the, the one? Is it the mushrooms, Jonah? Yeah, I think it's the mushrooms, it's isn't the it? the mushrooms. So how does this happen? How do you go so quickly from being the most outrageous thing that literally maddens people to a triumph to kids' music? <laughs>
Yes. I mean, the Rite of Spring is perfect evidence of the brain's astonishing plasticity. See, this is the really cool part of it for me. Mm -hmm. If you remember just one bit of science from this whole thing, remember this. Uh, those neurons we met earlier? I think that's right. The ones with the little voices? I yes. like them. Yes. It turns out those neurons learn. Oh, I see. And they learn fast. I am so smart. Because they're actually part of a larger network of brain cells with a very technical name. Called the corticofugal network. And what this network does is it's always sort of monitoring, listening to the sounds that are coming into the brain and tuning those neurons to better hear those sounds. Like trying to get the station on the radio, just getting it just right. So our neurons literally adjust. Literally, we're talking the biochemical engineering sense. So if on that first night you just hear the right as pure noise all the way through from beginning to end. If you're listening, if you're letting your corticofugal network do its job, it can actually re-sculpt your brain and let you hear the patterns better as the symphony evolves. 